Okay, so I just want to start with uh, by addressing a couple of questions that had been raised in the uh, past uh, during the tutorial and previous discussions. Okay, one of them is with regard to the temperature dependence of the threshold voltage. Okay. Now, what happens in practice is that the threshold voltage is a combination of a number of different parameters, right? It depends on the type of materials that are used and their work functions. It depends on the Na or Nd, that is the doping concentrations of the substrate the relation of that with the intrinsic carrier concentration and so on. Okay? So the result of this is that it is not straightforward to come up with an analytical formula which tells us how the threshold voltage directly depends on temperature. Okay? It is possible to sort of derive something based on what the components of the threshold voltage are. But ultimately what is done is that people have observed that the threshold voltage typically tends to decrease with increase in temperature. Okay? And typically this slope is approximately 2 to 4 millivolts per degree Kelvin. Okay? What that means is that if there is a 100 degree rise in temperature, your threshold voltage could come down by 0.2 volts or even 0.4 volts in the worst case. Right? So clearly this is not an exact formula, but for a large part around the nominal threshold voltage, this equation sort of holds. Right? So typically what happens over here is that Vt at some temperature is equal to Vt at the room temperature minus some k times the delta T, right? Where K is some constant of proportionality, which is this 2 millivolts per, uh, per Kelvin. Okay? Now, this is more of an observed phenomenon. There are some ways by which you can justify the equation in terms of the components of the threshold voltage. But once again, this is not something I want to get into because that definitely goes much more into the device physics and takes us away from the focus of this course. Okay? So, depending on the nature of the MOSFET, how it has been constructed, it is possible to get a little bit more insight into why this happens. As far as we are concerned, what we need to know is the threshold voltage has been observed to decrease with increase in temperature. Okay? But, what happens to the current, which is more important as far as a digital designer is concerned. Right? As a digital designer, yes, threshold voltage decreases, but I don't care about the threshold voltage by itself. What I do care about is the current that can be delivered by a transistor. Okay? Because that is what ultimately determines how fast my next stage, the stage that I am trying to drive, is going to get charged or discharged. Okay? As far as that is concerned, it turns out there is another competing element over here. Right? Normally, what I would expect is if the threshold voltage decreases, the current should increase. Right? Because after all, it is inverting at a lower voltage, right? So, for a given VGS, I should see a larger value of current, okay? But in this case, what happens is the mobility of carriers decreases. Why does this decrease? Typically because of thermal scattering, right? I mean, there is a lot more activity in the, molecule, in the atoms that are present in the substrate, okay? So as a result what happens is that the electrons or the holes if you think of them as physical carriers experience more of a resistance to flow which means that effectively you can model it as a decrease in mobility. Okay? Net effect is that the current decreases with increase in temperature at least the above threshold current. Okay. Below threshold is a different story, that is the sub-threshold leakage. 
that actually gets worse so it increases below threshold you do not want any current but it ends up increasing with temperature okay so above threshold you find that the current decreases with an increase in temperature below threshold the current increases with a uh, decrease in temperature or rather increase in temperature okay okay so as far as we are concerned the net effect is going to be that an increase in temperature reduces the current that can be delivered by a given uh, transistor for a given value of vgs vds etc therefore it will increase propagation delay what happens when propagation delay increases the maximum speed at which the circuit can operate decreases the frequency which is basically 1 over t okay so this essentially implies that performance usually measured as the speed the maximum frequency reduces okay so increasing temperature in that sense is bad for the operation of cmos circuits okay all right so that's it as far as the vt dependence on temperature is concerned the second thing that i wanted to clarify is especially with more with regard to tutorial 2 than 1 okay this one thing which you need to be very careful about when you are looking at a transistor what do we mean by saying that a transistor is on ha huh? right so typically we use this term the transistor is on to indicate the case where vgs is greater than vt okay why because when vgs is greater than vt a channel has formed it is possible for current to flow okay now this is different from saying that the transistor is in saturation so saturation and on are not the same thing right how do you decide whether something or whether transistor is in saturation you also have to look at the vds right so in general keep the equation in mind we have these three terms vds vgs minus vt vd sat and we take the minimum among these right depending on which one was the minimum if this was the minimum if vds was small that is the transistor is on vgs is greater than vt but vds is small what should the what region of operation is it linear if vgs minus vt is small what does that mean vgs minus vt is small so vgs is just greater than vt channel has formed but vds is greater than this vgs minus vt that effectively means at that drain gate interface that corner over there most likely you will have pinch off because the vds has become large some channel has formed vgs minus vt is there but the vds is greater so it has just pinched off that channel at that end okay this is true saturation as discussed in the case of long channel transistors okay for the short channel transistors typically what happens is vgs minus vt is some quantity vds is greater than that but it turns out that vds is so large that the electrons or holes are now velocity saturated right they are not able to go above a certain velocity simply because the they have reached that critical field okay so when vd sat comes into the picture it becomes velocity saturated okay so when you are trying to solve one of those problems there were like four inverters that were given to you over there and you were asked to dis, uh, you know analyze them okay what do you need to do you essentially need to think in terms of what do you expect the output voltage to be do you expect the vds that is the vo to be large or small based on that you make an estimate saying okay you know when the input is high for example the output should be low look at this combination over here ideally it should have gone all the way down to zero but maybe it won't go down to zero because both the 
top and bottom stacks are conducting. So you will end up somewhere in between, between 0 and VDD. Will you end up closer to VDD or closer to 0? That you have to make a guess. Okay? You estimate, okay, this is what I think it is going to be. Based on that, you decide whether you are in linear region, velocity, saturation or saturation. Plug in the equations, solve, put the numbers back in there, whatever VDS you get as a result of that and check whether your initial assumption was correct. Okay. Now, you could also just blindly assume what are the modes of operation, saturation. Solve the equation, see that the answer is wrong. Go to velocity saturation, solve, see that the answer is wrong. Then go to linear, solve, see that the answer is correct. Okay. But if you sort of think about it carefully, it should be possible to get the correct region of operation without too much guesswork. Okay, you should be able to sort of figure out which region the transistor is likely to operate in just based on intuitively what is the current likely to be over here without calculating anything. Right? Is it going to be large or small? That's all that we care about. Okay. So please use that carefully. Do not so two things here. One is on is not the same as saturation. Second is the guesswork that you need to do in order to figure out which region the transistor is actually operating in should not be too much. You should be able to sort of see those values and at least say whether it's going to be large or small and based on that pretty much hit the correct region quickly. Sometimes it can get tricky because these equations are such that the transition between saturation to velocity, saturation to linear is all in one small region over there. So depending on whether you get it off by 0.1 volts or so, you might end up in one or the other region. Okay, in which case you might have to guess and rework your answer. Okay, but still you will be fairly close to the correct answer if you depending on how intelligently you have guessed it. Alright, okay. So with those two notes aside, we are going to move on to the next topic. So, so far we were discussing propagation delay through an inverter followed by a chain of inverters and we essentially saw how we can sort of optimally drive a large load, right. So if my input stage is relatively small and my output that I want to drive is relatively large, if I just use one stage and try to drive a large load then that Cl by Co, Co uh, Ci, the fan out effectively is going to be large and that is going to directly add to my delay. In such a situation, what we saw was it is probably better to put in a number of stages gradually built up to driving a large load. Okay? And based on all the calculations and equations that we had, we found that it looks as though a factor of 4 scaling at each stage is a good number to aim for. Right? In terms of how quickly I can reach that final goal that I want to drive the lar last large capacitance. Okay? which is why we came across this concept of an FO4 inverter, the fan out of 4 inverter, right? FO4 delay rather, right? So when I have an inverter and it's driving 4 other identical inverters or one inverter which is 4 times the original size, we call that a fan out of 4, right? And the delay through that first inverter is called the FO4 delay. That's a sort of good measure of the performance of that technology itself in some sense because it is essentially one way by which you can estimate your RC, that constant. Okay. Alright, so the next thing, propagation delay is one part that you are interested in as far as circuit design is concerned. The other major thing is power consumption. Okay. There is a third element which is area. That area is something which I am not going to go into in much detail over here. Area today is actually almost a secondary parameter as far as digital circuits are concerned. Transistors are so numerous that you do not worry too much about area. Or rather, you need to worry. You cannot just assume you have as many transistors as you want. But usually the more important effect is how much are, how much power are those con transistors consumed. Okay? That is a bigger concern than how much space they are occupying. Okay? So to understand that, we want to get into what are the sources of power dissipation in a digital circuit. Okay. 
okay so let's first of all before we get into the maximum power consumption that i am going to face let's consider at least the different modes of operation of a circuit right under static conditions that is to say i just apply an input voltage and i observe an output voltage what does a inverter look like i have one p mos transistor i have one n mos transistor this is vo this is vr vdd and ground okay if vr is fixed at zero then what is the what are the two transistors doing what what uh, regions of operation are they in so the nmos is off right because vgs is zero which is less than vt okay the pmos has a large vgs or magnitude of vgs across it but the vds across it is zero in other words very small okay i mean the reason i'm saying very small is because i want to find out which region of operation is the closest that i can have is the channel has formed vds is small zero therefore it is the linear region right so nmos cut off pmos linear right the important part of here is i is equal to 0 right similarly if vi is fixed at vdd then the nmos is linear and the pmos is cut off again i is equal to 0 right which essentially means that the power consumption the power drawn from the source right what we are interested in is i have a source so here which is delivering a certain current right and my power is basically defined as vdd into i right and this is equal to zero in this case right but the fact of the matter is i have made an approximation over here the approximation that i have made is that the nmos transistor being cut off in place i is equal to zero okay in practice what is it there will be a sub threshold leakage current okay and what is the property of the sub threshold leakage current the important point is it is exponentially dependent on that vgs minus vt term right so any slight change in the vgs minus vt can result in a large change in <coughs> sub threshold current okay what that means is that even at zero vgs equal to zero there is a certain amount of current that is going to flow through the transistor why look at the nmos what condition is it in the vgs is equal to zero but vds is large right because vo is equal to vdd okay so it's encountering a large vds so there is something which is trying to make current flow through the fact that there is sub threshold conduction basically allows that current to flow the current is largely controlled by the vgs minus vt term itself not by the vds that's only a secondary effect on it right but the important point over there is that you end up getting some amount of sub threshold current the second part of that is that sub threshold current also increases with temperature so overall as far as i am concerned the sub threshold leakage power is going to be given by vdd times i sub threshold where is is equal to some is not 
p to the power of vgs minus vt by n thermal voltage and some secondary term on vds okay the important point is even for vgs equal to 0 is not equal to 0 ok is this significant is it going to be a major problem as far as the circuit is concerned quite frankly you cannot just say by looking at the equations you need to know the numbers ok and right now without going into any numbers in detail I am just qualitatively going to say that the subthreshold leakage is more and more important as we go to smaller technologies right in fact it reached the point in between where the total subthreshold leakage was comparable to the power being consumed during the active operation of the circuit ok but then of course people also the technology also sort of caught up other methods were used in order to make the circuits better from a leakage point of view because leakage became such a concern that people essentially said look all my power is going in leakage I am not getting any useful work out of it how do I prevent this from happening so there are techniques by which you can reduce leakage power ok right now the important takeaway is it is not something that can be ignored always in most cases we are more concerned with the so called dynamic power that we will get to in a moment right but the leakage power can also be significant and cannot just be ignored and say you know it does not matter ok alright so this as I said is under static conditions I have applied a static 0 or a static 1 as the input and I am observing what the output is going to be ok and finding out how much is the power being dissipated under those conditions now let us consider what happens to an inverter as the input changes from 0 to VTD. We will consider a slow change, let us not worry about a fast change right now, even a slow change is fine because it sort of serves to illustrate the next problem that we have, right. So what happens when the input is slowly varied from 0 to VDD, what do you expect the output to do? The output should go from VDD to 0, ok, will it go slowly or fast? that sort of depends on you know it will actually be a fairly fast transition because it depends on the VTC how quickly it is going right. So this business of how slow it is, is can be a little confusing if you are not careful with it right. But the important point is we can expect the output to also drop it goes from VDD down to 0 ok. Now what happens to this current? I am just going to call it ID right what is ID it is essentially the current that is flowing from VDD down to ground ok forget about the fact that there might be some load I am ignoring the load at the moment so there is no load uh, no current flowing into the load capacitance there is no CL that is connected therefore no current flowing in there I am varying the input from 0 to VDD the output is falling from VDD to 0 during that time I am saying that there will be some current flow directly IV from VDD to ground. Why should this happen? Because at some point as soon as my VI crosses VT of the NMOS transistor, the NMOS is on, on meaning channel has formed, current can flow. Okay, which region of operation is it in? It should be saturation because VGS minus VT is small among the three terms. Okay. During that time the PMOS is still in the linear region ok because VGS minus VT across it is large the VDS on the other hand is quite small ok. So some current starts to flow that is how after all we even drew the voltage transfer characteristics right? that is how we went about computing the midpoint voltage and things like that right? Now as I increase VI beyond VTN what do you expect will happen to this current?
what I'm saying is the current starts increasing. What do you expect is going to happen to the current? Will it keep on increasing? Okay, so let's look at it from the other side. What should I expect the current to be when Vi is equal to VdD? Zero again. What happens if I come down from that side? As I drop below VdD minus Vt of the PMOS, once again current will start flowing, right? The inverse argument over here. So what I can sort of expect to see is something like this. Not such a clean curve maybe, but whatever. Something of this sort I can expect is going to happen. Right? And in fact, this is what happens. You can run a simulation and essentially see how the current varies as a function of input voltage. Okay? It reaches some kind of a peak. At what point will it reach the peak? Not very clear. It need not be Vm. Right? There is no particular reason why it has to be Vm. Vm is only defined as the point at which Vo is equal to Vm. It does not say anything about maximum current. Okay? All that we know is when Vi is equal to Vi, both transistors should be in saturation. Right? Now, whether that is the exact point at which the current will also reach its maximum, maybe may not be. Okay. Right now, it does not matter as far as we are concerned. The point is, it peaks. Okay. So, what this means is that some amount of power is going to be dissipated as a result of this current which is flowing from VDD down to ground. Right? After all, that is the definition of power. Right? Whenever I have some current that is flowing from one terminal of the source to the other, right? from the supply of the terminal, so, uh, from the positive terminal of the source to the negative, that power is essentially being dissipated by those elements through which it is flowing. Right? If it was a resistor, it will just get converted into I square R heat. In the case of the transistors, again it will be converted into E heat, but you can't just call it I square R because you don't know what the resistance of the transistors is. Right? They are not, in other words, fixed linear resistances. Okay? But you can compute V into I, that is the definition of power and that is in fact how much is going to get dissipated. Okay? Now, this is when I am sort of varying the voltage slowly. What happens if I have a relatively fast transition, right? In other words, let's say that V i is going something like this. Okay, what do I expect V o to be? It will also be like this, but probably with a slight delay. How much is the delay? That will be determined by the you know the three R C one plus C L by C A, etc. Whatever those terms that I talked about, right? Something related to that. The important point is these are sort of dependent transitions. Okay. Now, if I was to plot ID on the same time scale, what I will find is that. it goes up like this okay essentially each time that there is a transition i am going through that sort of intermediate phase where both the transistors turn on for a while okay meaning that there will be some amount of current that shoots through from the vdd to ground i don't want this current ideally i would like the transistor to have switched in zero time from zero to VDD or VDD to zero, right? Output voltage. But in practice, it takes a certain amount of time. What happens during that time is that there is a certain current that actually ends up flowing. Okay. So this current is sometimes called the shoot through or the short circuit current. Right? Sometimes also called the crowbar current. 
this short circuit is probably the most common term that you will see for this. Okay. It happens every time that a gate switches. In this case, I have shown an inverter. But as we will see later, any kind of gate that we have, ultimately what is going to happen is that there will be some kind of a continuous conducting path from VDD to ground during that transition. Okay, and there will be some current that flows through it. Okay. So what are the I mean, so what can we say about this? What can we do in order to make this I mean, first of all, first question, is this a desirable thing or not? No, right? I mean, there is no particular useful function that we can see it performing, right? All that I wanted was to see the output switching from 0 to VDD or VDD to 0. There was no particular reason for a current to flow from VDD to ground. I mean, it is not doing anything useful for me. I wanted the current to flow into the output capacitance and charge it as quickly as possible. That would be useful. Instead, this is just going from VDD to ground and is a waste. Okay? So, what can we do in order to reduce it? what are the factors that sort of govern this and what can we do in order to reduce the impact of this that's what we would like to know okay so one thing that we can see from this timeline that i've drawn over here is there are a couple of parameters that come into the picture one of them is the height of the current i'll call it iscp the peak short circuit current okay the second is this duration delta t. Okay. Why are these two terms important? Because the area under this curve right, So the total energy that is being dissipated as a result of that transition is integral of vi dt, integral of the power over time, okay, vdt into integral of i dt, which is basically the area under that curve, right, if you are considering only that segment. What is the area under the triangle? Half base into height, okay, base is delta t, height is isc peak. So, what we can see over here is the VDD obviously is a fixed constant. What I would like to do is reduce these two terms, delta T and ISC peak as much as possible. Okay? ISC peak is more a function of how much current the thing can deliver itself. Right? Just based on the sizes of the two transistors, I am going to get a higher or lower value of the short circuit current. Reducing that may not be in my best interest because it will also reduce the actual current that the transistor can deliver. But delta T, essentially how do I change that? By sort of reducing the transition time. How quickly does it transition? Okay. If I can quickly go from the point of one tra the NMOS off to the PMOS off, right, cut off, that would reduce the amount of time required for this transition and thereby reduce the short circuit current. Now, it is not trivial to do that, it is just that that is a goal that we would sort of have in mind. But that is sort of what we would like to see, whether it is achievable or not is a different matter. Okay. So, alright, this is the so called short circuit current. It is one significant component of what is called dynamic power. Right? Why dynamic power? Because it is power that is being dissipated during the phase that the transistors are switching from one end to the other. Okay. So this is when some actual useful work is being done by the circuit. During that time, some switching happens, right? And that switching is essentially the dynamic behavior of the circuit, and the power being dissipated then is so the so called dynamic power consumed by the circuit. Okay. So, the short circuit current is an important part of that, but by far the most important component even as far as the dynamic power is concerned is the actual power dissipated in switching the output capacitances. Okay. So, 
So to understand that, let's look at it like this. What I have is an inverter driving a load capacitance. Right? This inverter, I'm going to draw in these two terminals. This is basically the VDD and the other one is ground. Why are those important? Because we sort of tend to forget those when we are drawing only the simple. Right? The important part is that when the input changes from let's say 0 to VDD and then later on from VDD to 0, the output will go from VDD to 0 and then high. Okay? The current that will flow when it is going from VDD to 0 will be like this and like this. Okay? So, in order to make the explanation a little bit clearer, actually let me change this slightly, right? What I am going to do is just change the order in which the transitions happen. Right? It makes the analysis a little bit more easy to explain. It does not change anything about what is actually happening. Right? So, what I am going to say is first consider Vi going from VDD to 0. What this will mean is Vo goes from 0 to VD. Right? And there is some current which I will call IL over here, right? Which is being drawn from the supply. Okay, once again same story. This is not IL, the Okay, just call it I, the total current drawn from the supply, right? Part of that current flows into the load, part of it flows directly down from VDD to ground, part of it just gets, I mean, the, as far as the current is concerned, of course, that is what happens, right. If we try to estimate the total energy that is drawn out of the supply during this transition, right, the VI, VI has gone from VDD to 0 and the output has gone from 0 to VDD, during that time, what can we do about what can we estimate about the energy that is being drawn out of the source? This energy is going to be given by the integral of V i d t. In this case, our V is V d t. I is some function of time yeah this is what we have yeah so the question is we want to sort of get an estimate of how much is the energy that is dissipated or rather drawn out of the source during this one transition. Okay? Some current has been flowing from the source into the PMOS transistor. From the PMOS part of it goes down through the NMOS, part of it goes into the load capacitance. Right? How much is the total energy that is drawn? Okay? In order to estimate this, what we can say is, alright, let me make an approximation that this is essentially going to be a sort of constant current. Okay? This is not an accurate approximation, but this is just something that we can use in order to get an idea of what this value is. In practice, I mean, you know, the what we are deriving over here turns out to be accurate irrespective of what we are doing over here and irrespective of the approximations that we make. But in order to understand it, those approximations will sort of help us. Effectively, what we are saying is, I can think of the output stage as just this, some constant current I going into CL, output voltage going from 0 to VDD. Okay? 
for now I am going to ignore the short circuit current. So assume that all of this I is going only into C I and is charging it up. Okay. So what happens as a result of that? Effectively what I can say is if I apply a constant current like this, the time taken to go from 0 to VVD, how much will that be? How much time will it take the capacitance to charge from 0 to VDD? Huh? Constant current. Why should it be 0? Right? How much is the charge that needs to get deposited on the capacitance? Finally, when it is charged up to VDD, the final charge on it is going to be CL into VDD. Okay? What is current? The rate of flow of charge with time. Okay. Which means that integral of VDD I DT, right? where I am not putting the limits of the integral but it is essentially over the transition from the start of the transition to the end of the transition right is going to be given by VVD into integral of I or rather not integral of I it is going to be taking I as a constant CL into VVD by I okay in other words, this energy is going to be given by Cl into Vdd square. So what does this mean? During that one transition where the input went from high to low and the output went from low to high, so much energy Cl into Vdd square is going to be pulled out of the supply. Okay? That is the amount of energy delivered by the source. What happens to that energy? What is the final state of this system? We have a capacitance which is charged up to VDD. Right? So going back to 12 standard physics, there is some energy stored on a capacitance, right? When it is charged. How much is that? Half CV square. Right? So if a capacitance CL is charged up to a voltage VDD, the energy stored on it is half CL VDD square. Right? The other half is dissipated as heat, where it flows through the PMOS transistor, so it essentially is in the PMOS transistor. Okay. So, by the way, this approximation that we made over here about the constant current and so on was just to make the calculation a little bit easier. You can do this even without making that approximation, the number will still, uh, or the value will still turn out to be the same. Okay? Effectively, what is happening during that transition is that so much energy is being drawn out of the source, the amount of energy drawn out is Cl into VDD squared, half of that gets stored on the load capacitance. The other half gets dissipated as heat. Okay. So what have we seen? We have essentially seen that the output has transitioned from 0 to VDD and as a result half Cl VDD square got dissipated in the PMOS and some energy is now stored on the NMOS. What will happen next to this circuit? After some amount of time the opposite transition has to take place. That is the only thing that can happen. Right? It has got charged from 0 to VDD 
The only thing that can happen is it will discharge back to zero. So what happens when it discharges back to zero? This is a situation where the input is rising, output is falling, right? The equivalent circuit corresponding to this is, once again I will assume a constant current, CL this point is initially at VDD, there is a constant current discharging it. Notice that VDD, the supply is nowhere in the picture. It is not part of the equivalent circuit for this falling transition. It does not matter, right? Because you have already charged the capacitance, that capacitance is now going only through the NMOS to ground. The PMOS is cut off, it is not playing any part in this transition. So all that can happen is whatever energy was stored in the NMOS will get dissipated through the, or rather was stored on the, on the load capacitance, will get dissipated through the NMOS transistor during the second transition. Okay, and we essentially burnt as heat. Okay, so overall what we have is Vi goes through these two transitions, Vo goes through these through these two transitions, right? Half Cl V D square gets dissipated here. Half Cl V D square gets dissipated. So, in one full cycle of the output, right, it has to be the output because I am finally considering this only with regard to the output. The output is charging or discharging, and that is where the current is actually being delivered by the so, uh, source into the load capacitance or being discharged through the NMOS, right. Why am I saying the output specifically? Because let us say for an inverter, it is the same input changes, output changes. But for a NAND gate, for example, I am concerned only when the output changes. I do not care about the fact that the input might be toggling. Let us say one of the inputs is at 0, the other input can change as much as it likes. That is not going to contribute to this power. What matters is when the output toggles. Okay? So, VO going from 0 to 1 and then back to 0 is one full cycle of VO. Okay? During that full cycle, the total energy that is dissipated is Cl into Vdd square. Now, if we extend that further and say that in general when I am looking at some particular gate in a circuit, right, I look at the number of times it is going to transition per second. How much is that? That is essentially the frequency of transition, right. So, the switching frequency Then the power dissipated is Cl into Vdd squared into F. So much energy per unit time, right? Energy times the number of transitions per unit time gives the energy per unit time, which is the power. Okay. So, this F of course over here is the actual frequency at which a particular node is switching, right. It is not, it is not directly the frequency that is applied to the circuit. So, it, it, so for example, if you talk about a processor running at 1 gigahertz, it is not the 1 gigahertz frequency. It is the frequency at which some particular node inside that circuit is switching, okay. So, Cm is the load capacitance, whatever is connected to that output of that node, VDD is fixed because it is just whatever supply voltage the system is operating at 
F is the rate at which that particular node is switching. The total power dissipated is Cl into Vdt squared into F. Okay. This is called the switching power, sometimes also called the dynamic power, although you know the dynamic power consists also of the short circuit power. Right? This is the major component of power dissipated in any digital circuit. Okay? Alright, we will stop here for now and continue.